Today we welcome back the 2017 Rancho Mirage Writers Festival alumni, Annabelle Gerwich. Annabelle is an author, comedic actress, and television host most recognizable from her stint as hostess of Dinner and a Movie on TBS. Annabelle is the author of four books, including the most recent, which we gave out today. Wherever you go, there they are, stories about my family. Please join me in welcoming Annabelle Gerwich. Oh, thank you so much, first of all. It's so fantastic to be back in town. Uh, the Writers' Festival, if you haven't been going every year, you really have to go. There's nothing like it. You know, for me, as, a, as an author, to get to come and to meet, for instance, the grandson of Harry Truman, very exciting, and to be able to say, you know, we're so connected. Your grandfather was the president of the United States, and my great uncle went to prison <laughs> when he was sent there by the Truman administration. See, we're just like, it's destiny. Where else can that happen? Uh, you know, also, you know, I started out and I had a 30-year career as an actress, and um, I really think of my career as an actress and a writer as, as very closely connected uh, because it's both about telling stories, except that they're completely different kind of lifestyle. I don't, people will say like, how did you make that transition? And I say, I don't know. It's real, what was I thinking? What was the plan? Because it's a completely different life. Um, I spent years working in theater, first of all, and then on, on sets, on television shows and movies with people, and now I'm in a room alone, all the time, staring out into the middle distance, um, writing. And so to get to uh, come here and meet my readers and uh, make new readers and connect with people who love books as much as I do, it's, it's the greatest of both worlds. And even to um, bring in all of the people from different parts of my life, um, I just talked to someone in the audience who was a fan of mine when I was gang girl, Gina Daniels, on The Guiding Light. And I, I wasn't gonna talk about that, but you know, in that crazy way that life brings all these things together, it is a pretty good story. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna get, well, I'll, I'll just say that. So, when I got the job on Guiding Light, it was, and this is, I'm going to go forward in time and backwards in time. It was right after my parents had lost all their money for the, oh, who can remember how many times? <laughs> was it the art galleries? Was it the softcore uh, porn business? Was it the ab scam scandal? I'm not was it the insurance company? I'm not sure which of my dad's businesses had just tanked, but um, I had to drop out of school and armed with the confidence of a 21-year-old who's just dropped out of NYU, what actually happened was, you know, I grew up in Miami Beach, Jewish girl from Miami Beach. I was walking through the East Village and I saw a black leather motorcycle jacket for sale on the side of the on the sidewalk, I bought that jacket and I didn't take it off for three years. And first of all, I'm a mother now, and when I think now that I just put that jacket on without washing it, if my son, I'm going to have to text my son after I finish talking now that I've remembered that and say, be sure if you buy clothes on the street, wash them first. But I put that jacket on and I created this persona for myself of being this tough girl and I worked as an actress for years playing this self-created invention. And um, when I got the job on Guiding Light, it was supposed to last for two weeks. My name was Gina and I was in a gang. And I wore that black leather jacket to the audition and then every day on the set. And I knew that my character was gonna last when they gave me a last name. <laughs> and the last name wasn't ethnic. I knew I had a future in Springfield and it was Gina Daniels. And I had, oh, I fell in love. I fell out of love. I had a drug problem. I had suicide attempts, good times. 
But that underwrote my early theater career. It was that job that allowed me to act in terrible plays, <laughs> off, off, nowhere near Broadway, <laughs> in unheated basements where your entire goal was to have sex with at least a few members of the cast. <laughs> Which, <laughs> it's pretty easy to do. I had goals that were attainable. So, <laughs> but now I'm a writer. <laughs> the, the truth is, you know, um, people who know me really well weren't surprised that after many years of acting, I turned to writing because I was that kid. You know, I had an itinerant childhood, which you will read about in this book about family. Um, and as we moved around the country, books were always my best friends. You know, I, you could take a book everywhere with you. Of course, I'm not going to say I know what your age is out there, but I know I'm of the age. <laughs> Before there were computers and streaming on the internet, and there were five channels, and the TV would go off, and the flag would wave, and that static would, right? And um, what you would have is books. The books were always on, and uh, books were my best friends. I took them everywhere, and one of the things that was, I was lucky enough to, to be able to be sent to a Jewish summer camp in the summers, where my favorite activity was pretending to be sick. So I could go to the infirmary, where it was air-conditioned, <laughs> where you didn't have to sleep on a bunk bed. Sure, you had to like have like, cold medicine, they gave you that, but you also got ice cream and you could read all day, which is what I love to do. And I still love to do that. Um, now that I, this is my, my fourth book, um, I want to talk a little bit about why I write and how I write and how the ideas come. People will say, well, you know, what is your inspiration for each of your books? And typically, there's, my books start with a question. Um, you know, there's that saying that I'm sure that you, you've heard and sometimes we repeat without thinking, which is write what you know. And I, I challenge that idea. I prefer the question and the answer when I'm writing it to, to, to address, write what you're interested in. Because what do I really know? You know, uh, I don't know that that would get me more than a third of a book. But I'm interested in a lot of aspects of life. And so every book gives me a chance to not only write what I know from my own experience, but to go out and learn new things. And I think that's the exciting thing about being a writer is issuing that mandate to yourself and being a reader. If you just read what you know, again, you'd read your diaries, um, but read what you're interested in. Well, that opens up a whole new world. So, for instance, um, my last book before this is called I See You Made an Effort. And I wrote that book on the indignities I faced uh, upon turning 50, which now at 56, about to turn 57, just seems like a laugh riot. <laughs> like, oh, yes. Oh, you kid, you, you. That was in my youth. Um, but um, in that book, you know, there's typically the overarching question, which was, how do we age? How are we supposed to age in this youth culture? And that was the overarching question. And then there was a particular incident. Well, there were a number of incidents that were adding up. And usually to sit down and write a book, I need an incident that makes me, well, outraged. I, I work a lot from anger. I think anger is a fantastic. Some people say like, oh, from love. Oh, screw love. <laughs> love makes you so happy, you just want to go to sleep. But anger is motivation to sit down and write a book if you're really angry about it. And what happened was I was in the supermarket and I was looking at one of those fashion magazines and it said, looking good at 20, 30, 40, and beyond. 
my God. Are they sending us to the beyond? I'm not ready to go to the beyond yet. I can't even say the number 50. And, you know, this is at that time when people were saying, like, oh, 50 is the new 40. And I thought, screw that. When you're 50, nobody who's 40 thinks you're the same age as them. <laughs> Unless you are really tattooed. Uh, and the only tattoo I had thought about getting was one that would be, like, right above my C-section scar. And it would read, under new management. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, you know, this was outraging me. And so that book is really to answer this question, you know, how do we age? And in that book, and, and I know they have copies of that one for sale, of, uh, just by the way, uh, that book has a pair of pink granny panties on the cover. And um, when I first saw that book cover, you know, as an author, you don't really get a choice about what, what's on your book cover. That's like a little secret of the publishing business, right? Uh, they tell you you have a choice, but you don't. What happens is it works like this. They sent me that cover, and when I first saw that, I thought, well, first of all, pink, oh, pink. I don't want to be put in that pink ghetto. You know, the, I actually, if you, if, you're, if you have some time, I wrote a piece for the New York Times about why I didn't want to march in a pink hat. I, I just, I don't, I don't want to be in the pink girl ghetto. Um, and I thought, no, these granny panties, no, this is too cute for me. And so they, sent, they said, oh, okay, so we'll send you an alternate choice. So this is supposed to be a book about what I call, you know, aging with a vengeance. I was like, screw aging gracefully. Tell that to the bad ankle that I'm standing on. I want to go aging with a vengeance, you know. Uh, this, they sent me the alternate book cover, which was a woman with a bucket over her head. So did I really have a choice? I have, I've actually embraced the pink granny panties, though, because I found out that the pair that they picked are like artisanal granny panties made by a company in Brooklyn. So I was like, oh, okay, they're, they're kind of hipster granny panties. Um, so that was, that was the inspiration and the idea, the sort of burning question, how do we age behind that book? Now, this book... This book was kind of a number of years in the making, um, but it also started from one of those questions. As someone who was always trying to run away from my family and join a new family, I have always thought, you know, I mean, always thought of host family as like a hostage situation. And I always thought, you know, isn't it funny that the way that people, when they want your business or your vote, they'll invoke that phrase, oh, we'll treat you like family. What does that really mean, we'll treat you like family? Maybe, maybe what we ought to say is, we'll treat you like cherished friends we rarely have a chance to see. That's what we should say. So it was sort of that premise that it was, the, you know, the burning idea behind this book, but there were a number of like inciting incidents of why I actually sat down to write it. And one of them started on the night uh, that Hurricane Katrina made landfall. So on that night, I was on vacation um, with my husband at the time uh, and our son, and we were in Vermont, and we were like so many people. We were watching the hurricane on television, and it just looked terrible. And I called my dad, and I said, I don't know, I can't remember which of our family are still left in Alabama and throughout the South. I, you know, I remembered I'd been born in Alabama and I lived there since I was five and we had moved away. But I didn't remember because we were really out of touch with the Southern part of our family. I said, Who, who's still there? Are they okay? Do we know how everybody is? And he said, everybody's fine. We've got, you know, our family in Mississippi and New Orleans and, and Alabama. He said, they're fine fine, but your land is taking a beating. <laughs> My land? I have land? I mean, with my family's history, 
I was just happy I wasn't going to one day end up in debtor's prison. I had no idea I had land. I said, land? What land do I have? And he said, well, you know, when your grandmother died, uh, because I was in bankruptcy and my brother was also in bankruptcy at the time, um, we couldn't inherit your grandmother's land on Dauphin Island. So that land is actually in the name of you and your sister and a couple of cousins of yours. So I hung up the phone and I said to my family, we're rich. We've got an island. We're, we're gonna build a summer home. This is amazing. And we had all these plans and just dreams, just like I, it was my life changed. And my son said, where is our island? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I've never been there. And of course, it turns out that this island is a barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Mobile, where our family lived. And my son said to me, our family's from Alabama. I didn't know there were Jews in Alabama. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I don't know how we got there either. I really have no idea. And that became the start of my research uh, into my family's history. And, you know, as one thing goes, it always leads to another thing. And so it became a research project and not only how my family got to Alabama, but what these Jews were doing in Alabama, how they had gotten lost. Everybody else went to Philly. They went to New York, like you do. What, what, what did we take it in the wrong turn? Like, just, you know, yeah, you, you go to the Lower East Side, the really Lower East Side, Alabama. You can't go lower, you're in Cuba. So, you know, I started this research project, and as I started researching, and, and you'll read about this, what we call the Shalom Yal tribe, uh, the history, and I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about that. It, when I want to say, you know, when I'm interested in this topic, the funny thing is, is um, very often it turns out that it's something that's sort of become something in the cultural zeitgeist. And what happened was, as I was researching this story, the subject of immigration was growing in the country. And so it, I could not have even imagined, because I started writing this in 2014, 2015, the earliest parts of this book were being written. I could not have imagined how important it is to talk about the immigrant experience and who immigrants are, who we think of as immigrants, and even to retell our own immigrant stories and, and decide, you know, I always say, why do we write memoir? Why do we tell our stories? I mean, is it just because I want you to know about the Gerwich family and how we got here? Well, yes, I do want you to know that. But more importantly, I want to use these stories as an example to talk about the greater issue, because I think when we know where we came from, it informs who we are and how we want to live in the world. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the details of this story, because and this is one of the reasons why I also like to write memoir, because I just think you can't make this shit up. <laughs> so <laughs> my family uh, came over. You know, we were those lucky immigrants who came over before you had to prove that you had skills that were important. This has become one of the uh, big issues in the Trump administration to prove that you are a, uh, you know, uh, you've got special abilities and, and, and a job in the United States. We didn't have that. We didn't have educations. Um, we really came from nothing uh, in the shtetl in Eastern Europe. It was right after the pogroms in Russia, the two parts of my family. One part were shipbuilders. 
And so they ended up in Alabama because they were following the work along the coast. They started in Quincy, Massachusetts. Then they worked their way down the Atlantic coast. Then they were in Charleston. And actually, Charleston is where the oldest synagogue is because there were Jews there very early on. And then they moved over to Chickasaw, Alabama. And then they were in Mobile. And they, were, they landed in Mobile. This is in the early part of the last century. So... Again, this is one of these ideas, and when I'm writing about this, I'm writing to challenge the idea of, like, when you think about Alabama, what do people look like there? Me! They're all related to me if they're Jewish. It's a very tight community. So the shipbuilder part of the family got down there. Then the other part of the family, my dad's family, uh, because my mom's family, they did go to Philly like you do. And they had a dry goods store also like you do. Uh, but my, in my dad's family, the southern part, and this is really a lot of what the story is about because it's just this huge sprawling family that my mother got sucked into not realizing what she was going to get into here. The other part of the family were fur trappers. And uh, they landed on the shores of the Mississippi in the late 1800s. And they were really criminal <laughs> types. <laughs> and what they were a great example of was what Malcolm Gladwell has called climbing the crooked ladder of success. And that is what a lot of early immigrants did. And when he, Gladwell wrote about this, and I'm writing about my family as an example, because it's pretty crazy stories, but it's also an example of the immigrant experience and what you do, and then how it starts and what it leads to, which is eventually, two generations later, you have educated people who are contributors uh, not me, but my cousins. They're all very upstanding people. Um, and my sister. Uh, but, uh, you know, very upstanding people in society. But the earliest ones of us, we were those criminals that Trump talks about. Committing crimes, living on the margins. This part of the family, they came to Mobile. And what happened was... One of my great-grandfathers opened a dry goods store, but he really had this side business working with the ship captains because what was happening at the time was all the sugar in America was coming through the ports in Mobile. And if the sugar got wet, you couldn't sell it. But there was a market for it with the bootleggers. The bootleggers didn't mind, because moonshine, one of the most important ingredients is sugar. They didn't mind if the sugar got wet. So that great-grandfather who got the nick, his name in Russia was Herschel. In America, he was just called Sugar. <laughs> right to the point. He went into, he got recruited by my other great-grandfather, who as a shipbuilder, could do welding, and he was, he was in league with the bootleggers fixing their stills. So he was managing the stills for the bootleggers. Then Sugar, these two great-grandfathers got together, got into the moonshine business. One had a daughter named Rebecca. One had a son named Ike, and those were my grandparents. I am standing here today because of white lightning moonshine. That's how I came to be here. And that's, I think, you know, an Amer a, a typical American story. Um, so they were all running these businesses. My great-grandmother, because, of course, it's a matriarchal family, very me too in the, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, she ran the family. I'm named after her. Her name was Annie. And in the store, she had a pickle barrel, and you'd come in and you'd knock with your little silver cup, the same cup for everyone, just by the way. Everyone who wanted moonshine in Mobile drank from the same cup. So really, I'm sure I'm related to everybody there. Um, she sold the moonshine in the pickle barrel. And these were hardworking people. At the same time, she had neighbors who were in the circus business. It was a fortune teller. And she, she had another side business at night when the shop was closed. She would bring jugs of the moonshine uh, and she would sell them to the women who were waiting to get their fortunes told. And if they had a particularly bad fortune told, they'd buy more moonshine. 
Or if they had a really good fortune told, they'd buy more moonshine. So she was on her feet from dawn till late at night selling this moonshine. And in the back of the store, they also had a building that had some rooms. And according to the family, she rented rooms out to women who had very short-term relationships. <laughs> there is speculation in the family that some of the jewelry that's been passed down was actually uh, paid instead of rent by some of these women who are working very hard. So, you know, I come from crime, um, and um, most of our family climbed this ladder out of that. My dad seemed to have gotten stuck on a rung or two, and uh, on the lower rungs. Uh, you know, he was brought up in this business where um, they had these stores, and they also ran uh, gambling boats in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is how I ended up with this land at Dauphin Island, because they had a little business uh, putting casinos on river boats that would run to got Dolphin Island before there was a bridge because you could gamble if you were offshore. So you could sell liquor and you could gamble there. And my family had been going to Dolphin Island since the 1920s and the 1930s. And uh, when they finally built a bridge to the island, my grandparents bought land there. And everyone in the family bought land there. Uh, but the family who made a lot of money they ended up selling their land and moving to Gulf Coast because uh, Gulf Coast became this sort of more high-end place, and Dolphin Island got the nickname the Redneck Riviera. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, my grandparents never had enough money for, uh, to build a house there or to leave there, and they never built on that land, but that land has passed to me. And actually, as part of the research for this book, I took a trip back to my ancestral land. Um, I had uh, arranged for a cousin's club to go back to the land. So I had about seven or eight cousins uh, involved in this. We all had grown up in Mobile and moved away because this is how we live now, right? So many of us are, we, we, we don't live near our families anymore. We've all moved to different parts of the country. And I got my cousins together and I said, let's do a cousins club. Let's go back to Dauphin Island together. So plan this trip. About three months out, out of maybe seven or eight cousins, there's about five of us left who are still in. Two months out. Oh, I can't go. My son's getting bar mitzvahed. A month out, we're down to four. Oh, I, I can't go. I've got work commitments. A couple weeks before, it's just me and my sister going. <laughs> the week of the trip, I get a call from my sister. Do you mind if I don't go? <laughs> I really, I really can't get away. So I had a cousins club reunion. It was me. I was the only cousin at the Cousins Club. But that, you know, the trip to Dauphin Island and that whole story is in here. But it also brought up this other question, this bigger question. So along with telling the story of my family and our immigrant history, and by the way, the time that I went down to Alabama for this research trip, there was this little senator there who had, had just tried to pass a law barring Syrian immigration to Alabama. And I took notes and I wrote about this, and then I thought, do I want to include a story about Jeff Sessions in my book? No one's going to know who that is. He's, he's, it's just going to be this little story. People are going to be like, oh, she's so in the weeds with Alabama politics. My editor actually convinced me to keep the story in, and I just, you just, I just couldn't believe it. I could not believe it later when he ends up to be our attorney general, still trying to pass these laws. And um, just as a coincidence, um, on my way down to Dauphin Island, and you'll read about this in the book, uh, the Uber driver on my way on the airport in Los Angeles was a, a Syrian refugee, and 
We talked about our, our ancestral lands and how he couldn't go back to Syria. And I told him I'd call him when I got back from my trip to my hometown, and I did. And now our families are connected. I, I have meals with them, I go to their events, I, I really consider him part of my larger family. And that, that brings me though to this question that really came up when I was the only cousin at the Cousins Club. And that really is, who is our family now? We know our blood relations are our family, but that's not how we live anymore. We live far away from our family. We make what sociologists call chosen families. We make supplemental families, people you go to school with, people you raise your children with, like my friends who are here today, Barry and Chris, who we've raised our kids together, or people that you marry into a family, like my friend Trina who's here today, um, even though my sister and her husband um, divorced years ago, we're still related because we're, we'll always be family. Um, you know, so, and our work families, and then there are chapters in this book that I include where I explore this notion of who is our family. So uh, one of the stories in the book asks the question, our pets are family. <laughs> now, when I waded into this, I did not anticipate that after I went on Bill Maher's show and talked about my idea, now, don't rush the stage when I say this, that I don't think pets are family. <laughs> I had to post pictures of myself with my cats on Twitter because people were mad at me. Oh my, no, my four-legged family member is family. And the way that this story started was um, there was a Thanksgiving at my sister's house, and one of my best friends, she's like a, our third sister. We've known her since we were kids. We're, our families are so close. So she showed up at the Thanksgiving dinner with her dog, who she was wearing in a baby sling. <laughs> and she hadn't told us she was bringing her dog. And she sat the dog at the table and served the dog from my grandmother's china. And my sister, who's a total perfectionist type A person, she had this smile on her face that looked very welcoming, except if you know her well, you know that smile means you are dead to me now. But that really made me ask the question, are pets our family? And so in that chapter, I, this is where right what you're interested in comes in. I really didn't know. So I decided to do an experiment and see if I could bond with my friends, cats and dogs, like I do with their children. And so I went out and tried to befriend them. And let me just say, you can't really get to know someone else's cat. <laughs> dogs, yes. Cats, no. And uh, in that story, I actually end up uh, at a uh, dog rescue sanctuary in the high desert, participating in their volunteer day where you agree to be locked in a kennel with the dogs and spend the entire day in the kennel outside so you can experience what it's like to live in a pet sanctuary. And don't do it, people. <laughs> do this. Don't, you know, so you can find yourself in some strange situations when you follow what you're interested in. There's also stories that explore the idea of um, how humanist groups are trying to take the place of religious organizations from people who feel orphaned if they're not associated with a church or a temple. And I again, try to go out and join these groups. And so I, I call this as part of the exploration of this book is families I have joined accidentally or on purpose. Um, I look at one of the things that's one of the most important things to me, which is women's friendships and sisterhood. And I, uh, there's a story in the book on the multi-level marketing groups and how they use sisterhood as a recruiting technique because they will tell you that this, this company will become your new family. Uh, my name is Dirt to everyone who is in the multi-level marketing industry now. <laughs> um, that story is also uh, 
and NPR featured that story on Marketplace, and that story is also online uh, at Marketplace. That was one of the most important stories I wanted to tell because I wanted to tell the highs and lows of family, how it can be used for good, and also invoking family can be used in ways that are sometimes detrimental. You know, I hope that when you read this book that you will see that my message in this book is ultimately... It's a, I think of it as a, a pain against tribalism. I truly believe that our future as a world will depend upon our ability to see past our small clans and to see each other as family. And the idea is that when you know someone's story, and of course, I think a great way to get to know someone's story is by sharing a meal with them, like I did with my Uber driver, the most fantastic food. Um, that's a great way to get to know someone's family. But I, I really hope that you will get that message of inclusiveness. Um, in the journey in the book, I did, you know, I had spent these years trying to get away from my family. Um, but the end of the book chronicles, um, in some ways, a homecoming with my parents. Uh, at a certain point, uh, my sister and I got to the position of being the caregivers. And because my parents transitioned to uh, what I call Tel Aviv Gardens, not so cleverly disguised, the Miami Jewish home, uh, was so hard, I became a part-time resident at the home. I rented the apartment next to them, which, uh, separated by a thin particle board wall, was terrifyingly much like my childhood, growing up right next door. It was like living in the same place as them. Um, but it chronicles that time there, and my mother and my adventures, and a bonding that we had, that we only really had near the end of her life. And um, one of the things that we did together, we went to poetry class together. We went and took a chair exercise class together twice a week, which I have to confess, I was incredibly competitive with stroke victims. It's very unattractive. That, just, I don't know what it was, but I just got in there and I just said, Lillian, I'll see you five push-ups with that chair. I just got, it was a little out of control. Um, but it, this, the book tells about our unlikely adventures there. And I, I did a piece, which you can see online for the PBS NewsHour, about how that time in my life was transformative for me. Um, Joining that tribe of elders was an unbelievable experience because, you know, um, we tend to marginalize people who's, and put people in different places where we don't get to know them. And I got to have this incredible experience of getting to know the residents there in an intimate way, and I still keep in touch with them. And when I was down in Miami recently, I had just one of the most rewarding experiences because I found out that something my mother and I had done, which was we were a little disturbed that the playlist for music and the chair exercise class, which was primarily Sinatra. Now, I love Sinatra. I don't want to say anything here bad about Sinatra. <laughs> But it also included songs like Don't Get Around Much Anymore. <laughs> we worried about that. So um, we had it updated, and uh, the playlist uh, still includes, which I was just found out a couple weeks ago, it still includes Disco Numbers by KC and the Sunshine Band. <laughs> So that every Tuesday and Thursday, the residents of Tel Aviv Gardens shake, 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 <laughs> shake, 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 shake their booties from 9 till 9.45 a.m. Very satisfying. Thank you. Um, how much I, 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 I have a couple more things I wanted to do today, which is take questions, because that's my favorite part, is to have some questions. Um, I also could do a little reading, but if there's questions, that's really the most fun. So how about we open it up? Yes. 
Okay, that's a great question. And uh, the question was, do I write outlines for each of my books? No, I do not. Do you want to... Do you want to spank me now? Um, I don't write outlines, but what I do do is, and I have one of my books here with me, my writing books with me, because I'm always, I am that person who is always writing, scribbling notes. So what I do, and, and if you're a writer or uh, you want to be a writer, and when I say you want to be a writer, it just means you haven't sat down and written, because everyone can write. And let me just make this, this pitch to you right now. Writing is a redemptive act. Whether you're writing for publishing, whether you're writing for your grandchildren, whether you're writing just for yourself, writing is a way to reclaim the events and the emotions that drive you. And I urge you to do it. There's never a moment of writing that you will do that, will, that doesn't make you feel better about life yourself or bring you to a better understanding. So that's my little pitch about writing. So what I do though is I, I um, and I'm not, I'm not like a talented artist person, but I do timelines and I like to sketch things out. And like I said, I have my book with you and if you're interested, I'll show you my next book, which right now exists in a bunch of pages and a bunch of drawings, which will say, uh, the journey that I want to take in a book. It's easier for me to see it. And when I teach writing, I, 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 I love a whiteboard because I'll sh I make little thought bubbles and maps. And if I can write out the journey like a map, it's so much more, I'm able to wrap my head around it in a way that I can't do on a page doing one, two, three, four, five. It just... That doesn't, that kind of depresses me. I feel like I'm doing my taxes. You know, it just, it's too linear. But then, if I can do a map, then I can draw, this is a journey that I'm taking. I want to take this journey from here to here. And I know that there's benchmarks along the way, so I'll write down the known benchmarks. But then, I have this other space above and below, and if something new occurs to me, I, I put it in like a little circle, and I'll say, oh, experiences with blah, blah. And I'll put that in a circle, and then when I know where I want that to go, I draw a line onto the map. So it's much more, um, it's much more creative. I, uh, I, I think I, I know I read about this somewhere years ago, and I really, I really believe in doing that. So um, that was a really long answer for a question on do I make an outline. Um, oh wait, before Jamie, I mean, get right back there, yes. Okay, so, you know, the question was about, are some of the people alive, and do I like how, do they like how I portray them? You know, um, there's a quote, and I cannot remember who said it, but someone here could Google it, or they'll probably know. Someone said once, um, when a writer is born into a family, that family is ruined. <laughs> or that family is finished. I can't remember, ruined and finished, finished and ruined, both. So um, the answer is, as one would expect, mixed. <laughs> there are people who in my family who love this, these stories and who participated in my um, gathering of, I did a lot of interviews. I just spent such a long time doing interviews, but I'll tell you, there are some people who were not happy about my revealing uh, crimes and things like that in particular. And there was one really controversial thing. So um, in the book I write about, part of my family got, and still is today, extremely wealthy in Alabama. And one of my cousins, um, whose name is Bubba, because we're Southern. <laughs> I, in fact, I, have a, I had a cousin whose name, well, he was called Brother in the family, and I never even knew he had another name <laughs> because he was Cousin Brother, Cousin Brother. So my cousin Bubba, though, became extremely wealthy. In fact, he was the president of APAC at one point. Uh, Bubba Mitchell, uh, very wealthy, uh, millions and millions of dollars. When he first made money in Mobile, uh, 
he tried to join the Mobile Country Club. And he was turned down. He was told, we're not taking your kind. When he became a so wealthy that he donated, this is, you can just look it up, I can't remember, like, I don't know, 30, 40 something million dollars to the University of Alabama, the Mobile Country Club came back and said, you know, we're letting in you folks now. <laughs> and he said, fuck you, <laughs> not joining. So, I got a call from his daughter who was incredibly upset that I had written this story. Because, as it turns out, her kids now belong to the Mobile Country Club. <laughs> and she didn't want it to be an issue for them. And what I found out later was eventually he did join, but he, he only joined when they said they would take every Jewish person who applied. And I, she wanted me to take the book, the story out of the paperback. So I want to just mention, you could find that story in the paperback. <laughs> um, I feel it's a really important story because it's a story that really speaks to how recent and how, uh, and how um, important it is to remember, all for all of us, that we have all been otherized in some way or another as immigrants. In fact, I also mentioned in the book, it wasn't until 2015 that Jewish girls were allowed to become debutantes in Alabama, in Mobile. 2005, that's yesterday. It's, um, it's just truly, now why anyone wants to be a debutante? <laughs> That's another question. I don't, I'm someone who put on a dirty black motorcycle jacket, black leather motorcycle jacket, and never washed it. So I was not debutante material, but if you want to do it, you should be allowed to. 2015. So some people in the family have not been happy about it. My mother really struggled with the idea that I was going to write this book and talk about our financial struggles, I want to mention. And that is also one of the things I just will mention that was really important to me to write about. I wanted to write about what it's like to try to live the American dream and not always make it. I feel it, it's caused a lot of shame for her and, um, and for others. To, the idea of, of talking about financial instability would help relieve that shame. And I'm happy to say that readers tell me that, that they appreciate that. Um, and you'll, I do write about how actually, ultimately, the ab scam scandal brought my family down. It's so crazy. Um, but I hope that that's something, if that's ever been an issue for you, that, that you'll see in the book, too. I want to take that shame away from that. Uh, experience. Jamie, you had a question. Did you tell us about your Jerry Springer story? Oh, I, I, we were just having lunch and I, you know, this is, you know, as an actor, you just find yourself with the craziest people. <laughs> um, and I was talking about how um, when I was on dinner in a movie, uh, most of the guests on that show uh, were unknown comedians at the time who were friends of mine, people like Bob Odenkirk from Better Ass Saul or, or Jeff Garland from the Goldbergs. These were all people who were just my friends who were barely working at the time. And I would invite them to come on. But sometimes we'd have a mandate from TBS, like we had every wrestler on because they had the wrestling thing. And Jerry Springer, for some reason, was involved in TBS. And I had said to the, to the, to the network, I'm not coming that day. I'm not going to be on the show with Jerry Springer. Jerry comes on the show, and I just fell in love with him. <laughs> he was so charming and intelligent and adorable, and I just couldn't believe it. Here I am, like, oh, my God, I love Jerry Springer. And I came home that day, and I told my husband, oh, Jerry Springer's the greatest guy Cut to a month later, my family, we're in New York on some TBS business. We're staying at the plaza. My husband and son are waiting for me downstairs. I get into the elevator, and Jerry's in the elevator. We ride down together. We're talking. The elevator door opens up, and Jerry kisses me. Goodbye. But it, it's like a, it's a good kiss. My face turns red. There's my husband saying, I knew it. <laughs> You've been having an affair with Jerry Springer. I'm just gonna say, I'm in the middle of a divorce now and it's not because of Jerry Springer. 
if you if it comes out in the press soon that I'm you know this because we haven't really announced that but you know I'm getting divorced but you will know Jerry Springer is not involved. I just want to make that clear because my husband is still convinced I had a thing with Jerry. Yes. Oh, so the question was, and I should have repeated it, I'm so sorry I didn't repeat it, was about our pets, our family, and this lovely lady here was saying, in defense of people who are animal lovers and who don't have children and who, to, who are just so deeply bonded with their animals, please go to Twitter and you will see my cats. I have trained one of my cats to sleep under my chin. I love, yes, I'm... I'm single now. <laughs> I might be forever now that I, I will, maybe I won't tell this story in public <laughs> or on dates, because that's not good. Um, I love my cats and I love everyone who loves their animals. I'm just making the distinction that um, my cat didn't call me when my mom died. <laughs> My cat didn't say congratulations to my son when he graduated high school. My cat will never call me when my car is stalled on the freeway and come and get me. But I love animals and I, and I, and I, and look, I, I, it's, I'm not against animals at all. You know? It's getting worse and worse the more I say it. I realize that. But just remember, I, I truly, and, and I mean, really and truly, it's nothing, it's just about, what I'm really thinking about is the fetishization of animals. And what I talk about in the book is the kinds of things like you can buy a $200,000 dog house with heated beds and we have people living on the streets. So I'm just, I'm, and again, I'm asking this question. I'm not, you know, cat under chin. How about other questions? Yes. Oh, gosh. Um, I did the show Dinner in a Movie. The question was how long I did it for seven years. And as typical of me, it was something that I thought was really stupid when I auditioned for it. I went begrudgingly. I was like, well, this is ridiculous. And um, if you didn't see the show, it was just a really... Uh, fun conceit where uh, the other host and I, Paul Gilmartin, we would cook a, a theme dish based on a movie, and it was usually a terrible movie. And it just made Turner's library of movies that were just, he was just trying to flog them off on Friday nights when people were out. Um, it just made them more fun. And what was really great about that job was... Um, I, I had a little soapbox, and so I could talk about things that interested me, like certain filmmakers, or sort of the more, the sillier parts of movies, or things people might not know about context with films. I had gone to film school, and so it was really fun for me to, to do that. And also, you know, what's been amazing is my fans from that show have followed me to my writing career, and I'm, I'm so grateful that I said yes to it, because I was always, misreading things like when I went to read for Friends and I don't get this and then I went to the taping of the pilot of Friends and turned to my husband and said this will never last <laughs> so um, luckily I said yes to, to that show because it really has it's really fun when I go around the country now as an author people have um, you know have, ta have taken this ride with me and um, I, I'm so lucky that I've gotten to live these different kinds of lives, you know, and that a lot of that is due to the dinner and a movie audience. Yes. Oh my God, that's so funny. The question is, as an author, will you ever go back to the book that you've just completed? You know, um, as an actress, uh, I have had the good fortune of working with 
um, or meeting lots of really brilliant people. And I was sitting one day with Martin Scorsese, and uh, he was telling me about how the movie King of Comedy just didn't work. And I was telling him, but it did. I'm telling Martin Scorsese. No, you're wrong, um, Mr. Scorsese. Uh, he said he never got to make, he never got that movie right. And that really, I've never forgotten that conversation. And you'll hear a lot of people say that, but just that really impressed to me because I love that movie and I think so highly of him and his artistry. And I think you, you, you only write, and someone else, an author said this, I can't remember who it was, because I'm 56. Um, and an author said once, you write the best book you can at any given moment. And I would like to go back and rewrite everything I've written. I think I could do it better. I could do this book better now, because the book exists and I could actually rework, I could, you know, I, uh, so I feel that way about just about everything I've written, except for the pieces I write for the New Yorker, because they make it so fucking hard <laughs> to get published, that you have to work on every single syllable. It's so buttoned down that I, if when my stuff in the New Yorker, no, I walk away from you. But everything else, I, uh, I would like to redo. And my goal as an author is to keep uh, working on my craft, to keep getting better all the time. It, it, if I'm not doing that, what am I doing? You know, so um, I can't go back and, and, and do those books. But I can take something that I've learned from the last book and put that into the new book. So that's just always... My, for instance, this book is a little bit longer than the last book. I know that sounds really silly, but the reason, it's not just like, oh, I wanted to write a longer book. What it was was I had challenged myself, and my editor had challenged me. My Part of my book contract was to write a larger word count. It was actually in my contract. Um, the I See You Made an Effort book is maybe like 50-something oh, thousand words, Four, between 40 and 50, and this one, it was supposed to be at least 60,000, and it was actually like 72. It's so funny, but this is really how you do it. You don't do it by pages when you're writing. It's word count. It's like 72,000-ish words, and my goal was to write longer essays to see if I could sustain my interest and the reader's interest. You can be the judge. <laughs> Maybe it works, maybe sometimes it doesn't work. But the goal was to write longer form essay. So I always have a challenge uh, for myself that maybe won't appear anywhere in the pages, but it's my challenge to become a better author. Again, a longer question. Um, are there any, we have time for a couple more? No. One, 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 one more, one more question. Yes. Ooh, gosh, that's a good question, Larry. Um, what was my, the question is, what was my biggest aha moment? Okay, I'll just say this, you know, this is one of these things that uh, I think only comes at, maybe at a certain age, but the realization that I am so much like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, that's all I can say. You, you know what I mean? That it just really, and that that's okay because we're human. And that allowed me a certain kind of forgiveness and compassion. And it just changed the whole relationship. Once I could see my parents as characters in a story, to have that detachment, I was able to love them in a way I could not love them when I was younger. Um, this has been so much fun for me. I hope this has been fun for you. Thank you.